going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 1. you got your Bibles. And just to go along and say, to add to the little word that Joe just shared this morning there, what picture came to my mind was you've seen these scientists, physicists and stuff that they've got these equations on the whiteboard and every little line, every little number, every little detail counts in coming up with the answer. You know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it, one, one piece hinges upon the other piece to produce the answer to whatever the equation, whatever it is that they're looking into, studying out, experimenting with. And it is also the same thing when he's talking about revelatory prayer, is that we pray according to the will of God, of course. And so whatever the Spirit's revealing to us, we ought to be writing it down. And every little word, every little key, every little saying, um, sign, anything and everything, we ought to be writing down because as important as those equations are to the scientist, how much more little nuggets of truth that God gives us along the way that we are to engage in when it comes to the Father's business. I mean, we're, we actually are in business, if you, if you believe this, and I, and I know that you all do because you're believers, is that what we're engaging in is not only the Father's business, but the most important business. And so every little key, every little saying, every little term, everything that you just pick up in the spirit realm, write it down because it, because it becomes part of the whiteboard, if you will, of all the stuff that you're involved in with you and the Lord that's going to manifest. Because remember what, we're, what we've been talking about on earth as it is in heaven. Now think about this. If you don't do that, look what we miss out on. If that scientist misses one number, one, even with mathematics, it's got to be right on. Then the, then, the, then the bottom line is it doesn't play out exactly like it's supposed to. And then there's, some, there's a disconnect somewhere. What happens, I've got to go back and go over the whole thing again. And so, again, I just want to reaffirm what he's saying, that write this stuff down and, and take it to heart and, and take it maybe a little more serious than what you have in the past. Yeah. And I believe that you'll see a, a difference. I believe you'll see a manifestation of it. A couple weeks ago, I shared a personal testimony uh, about not a whole lot anymore moves me. I wasn't being critical, saying that. I was being honest that... I don't see a lot of stuff happening in, in these days, especially within the confines of the church, what I call authentic. I believe we are cookie-cutter Christians that are mimicking what other people are doing and getting by with it in our lives and church services and our missions and our work and everything. We're just doing what somebody else is doing. We've been taught more than we have caught what God is doing. And that translates into dead works, uh, counterfeit because religion is full of dead works and I don't believe that it's producing any light, just stuff that's to me personally fake, plastic, form, function, there's no life on it. And so I'm looking for, and I said this a couple weeks ago, I'm looking for that which is authentic, that which is real. And 2014, the word that came to me just in the service, not prior to it last week, was the scripture came, deep calleth unto deep. I don't know what that actually means. I can tell you what that means, but I'm sure that there's so much more to that, and I'll let the Holy Spirit define what that means to you. I just heard deep calleth unto deep. But I do know this about God's depth. It's authentic. When he's taking you into things that are deep, they're real, and they're full of life. Let God take you into the things that are deep. Not the world, not the church, not religion, because all you're going to get there is the same old, same old. And I know you're tired of that. You've got, you've, you've got to be. It's the real deal, authentic. Now, the word authentic uh, means being oneself. I'm not going to try to be you. You're not going to try to be me. In fact, it goes a little further biblically in that I'm being myself out of the identity of what the word says I am. 
So I see what the Word says, and I'm going to be that. I'm lining myself up with that. No one else, nothing else, but what the Lord has revealed to me inwardly is what I become. That's authentic. And I'm going to be real at that point. That's been genuine as well. And the very fact that there is what we talked about last week, engaging the new year, that we don't want a counterfeit, do we? We don't want something that looks like God, something that acts like God, but we want something that is God. I don't want a, a, an experience that we're mimicking because somebody else experienced it and we're just Amen. passing that on down. We don't, we don't want that because that, we, we've done that. We've tried that and it doesn't work because it's not real, it's not authentic, it's not genuine. And the very fact that there's counterfeit means that there's not something authentic. Think about that. If, if there's counterfeit money, for instance. Counterfeit money, mean, counterfeit money means what? That there's real money out there. And if there is deception out there and there's counterfeit out there, that's proof positive that there's something real and authentic and genuine that God's calling us into that we need to be open to. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning is let's be looking and seeking and waiting for, not settling for the counterfeit or some shallow presentation of the gospel, just some other teaching that's been regurgitated since the 70s and 80s and 90s, and we're just hearing these guys continue saying the same thing but from a different angle. No, I'm saying let's wait, not settle for, but let's wait for that which is real and authentic that comes from God, and it is and when he gives it to us, it will be deep calling unto deep. Now, as I said earlier, and even in the prayer this morning, 2014 can be a great year for all of us. And I say not will be, but can be. Because that's going to be up to you how you handle what comes down the pike at you in 2014. You do not have complete control over the events of your life. Because if you did, then you would control people. Now, you're not on an island. And if you were on an island, you wouldn't be able to even control the weather that's on that island. So you are not in complete control, but you are in control of yourself, how you handle the things and the events that happen around you. You can make the difference by your attitude, by um, how you see things, the lens you look through, and the attitude that you have, and the faith that you continue to be in. Um, so it's going to be according to your faith. 2014 is going to be according to your faith. Because God has given us too many promises in the Bible that you're going to come out on top in 2014 no matter what happens. You believe that? Amen. Yes. But it's going to be up to you. Now you can go now, now we can fast forward 360 some days and get to the end of 2014 and you can say what a terrible year. You can say it's been a tough year. But we've overcome. We've turned the thing around. Every negative thing, every pressure that comes upon you this year can have one or two effects. A positive effect where you get better or a negative effect where you get bitter. That's just going to be up to you. All right. Now I want to share with you some scriptures that we talked about last week, but I'm going to add more to them. But I want to go over them again, because I, I, I just quickly went through them last week, and I'm, and I'm going to go through them again quickly. So I hope that you're going to write these down. Deuteronomy 1.1 1, 1 says, there are, These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness. Verse 5, You've stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey. Verse 8, See, I have set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land. In other words, You've been at this mountain long enough. I've got something new. Isaiah 43. Behold, I do a new thing. Um, forget what lies. You know, forget the former things. Consider not things of the past. Behold, I do a new thing. So this new thing God's doing is taking you into a deeper aspect of promise of land. Verse 8. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land. So you've got the license to go get what is legally yours in Christ. Verse 11. May the Lord, the God of your fathers, make you a thousand times as many as you are and bless you as he has promised you. So this is talking about becoming greater, not lesser. 
All right? Not necessarily material things, but as a person. In Christ, all that God has done for you, you receive more of that. Verse 21, see, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up, take possession, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has told you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Now in chapter 2, verse 3, he says you've been, it says, he's reiterating this, you have been skirting around this mountain country long enough. Turn northward. And the word north always represents going up. And according, as we talked about last week, according to Isaiah 60, he talks about the upgrade from wood to brass, from brass to silver, from silver to gold, because God's always taking us into deeper things. And if God takes you into something deeper, it's going to be an upgrade. It's going to be better, right? It is also going to be in accordance with who you are in him, not the head, but, or not the tail, but the head. Now, Deuteronomy 1.27, now this is where we're going to pick up this week. Now listen to what the word says here. You murmured in your tents. Just stop there. God sees what you're saying and what you're thinking in your house. Not just here in church. You can amen what I'm saying in church, but go home and complain and murmur about your situations and circumstances. It's easy to amen me here, but go home and unamen me. Right? Yeah, I heard what he said, but he doesn't know what I'm going through. He says, you murmured in your tents and said, because the Lord hated us. Now, this, this is not just these people. We do the same thing. God, you, you're mad at me or, or you, 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 you've forsaken me. I've done something wrong and you're, you're displeased with me. It doesn't necessarily, you don't have to necessarily say God hates me, but I'm, I know I'm not one of his favorites. I'm not Billy Graham. Right? I mean, if I was John Hagee, hell, I could just move some mountains around and get this thing working, but I'm not. And God's, I'm this second class citizen in God's kingdom. That's not the case. You've got to understand the murmuring in the tents is a result of how you see yourself, your identity in God. He hates me. Therefore, we can't defeat these giants and we're going to murmur in our tents about all the crap that's going on in our lives. Now watch. You murmured in your tents, verse 27, and said, because the Lord hates us, he's brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us to the hand of the Ammonites, to destroy us. This is what God, God's out to destroy me. He's not out to make me a thousand times better. He's out to destroy me. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have, now we'll look, look at this. Watch this. Whither shall we go up? Now look at this next part. Our brethren have discouraged our hearts. So you, you see the dynamics? There's an identity problem. God hates me. My brothers are discouraging me. In my heart, I'm discouraged. Therefore, I murmur in my tent. This is all what happens in even our lives today. The people are greater and taller than we. Our, the cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the An Anakim there. There I said unto you, dread not, neither fear or be afraid of them. The Lord your God, which goes before you, he shall fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Now drop down to verse 31. And in the wilderness where thou hast seen how the Lord thy God Bear thee as a man does his son in all the way that you went until you came into this place. In other words, God brought you here. He went before you and bore you up. Yet in this thing you do not believe the Lord your God who went in the way before you. God goes before you to search out a place to pitch your tents in, in fire by night, to show you by what way you should go and in a cloud by day. And the Lord heard the voice of your words and was wroth. And swore, saying, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which I swore to give unto your fathers. Now here's a generation. And I, I, I've said this before, but it's, it's, it bears to be repeated. Now here's a generation that God went to Egypt and, and split a Red Sea. Now you're never going to see a, a, probably a Red Sea or any sea or any river or even a stream be split so you can walk through it. Now, I'm not saying that won't, but come on. He, he went out of his way. Ten plagues broke the back of one of the most powerful nations for these people, for this generation. Splits a Red Sea to get them through. Water out of a rock. Manna from heaven. 
fire by night, cloud by day. I mean, he goes out of his way to get them to a land knowing all along they're not going to enter in. Now you, we get spoiled by God. Well, if he split the Red Sea for me, he's surely going to get me in that land. Well, was that the case with this, with this generation? So you're, you're, here's the mindset. Well, God saved me. I'm here. Look at all that he's done for me. Surely I'll get what I'm supposed to get since I got what I got in the past. But that's not the case. That's you becoming an ease in Zion, not realizing that you can miss some things that God has for you just because he did some great things for you in the past does not necessarily mean you're going to get the great things that he has for you in the future. This generation missed a blessing, an, an aspect of their inheritance, which was the land at that point, and they're going to go back and skirt that mountain some more. So I'm, what I'm saying to us in 2014, don't just because Joe Osteen told you a bunch of stuff that's going to happen for you this year is not a guarantee that it's going to. Because it's going to require faith, not just because someone said it to you or because it's in the Bible. It's going to require you to have faith and hold on in spite of what you see. You're not going to be able to have a grasshopper complex going into 2014 as they did going into the land. So this is a reality message today that just because it's there, you can have it doesn't mean you're going to get it. And God loves you. And there's grace. There's mercy. It's not a guarantee that you're going to get it if you are discouraged in your heart. You murmur in your tents because you've got a grass out hopper complex that, hey, the giants are too big. The walls are too fortified. The cities are walled in. We can't do it. Right? So do you understand... And I know we've said this a zillion times, but it's, it's just so true that Jesus looks at a generation himself and says, be it done according to your faith. I will do everything your faith allows me to do, as the word says. Every promise I give you, I will do if you will just entrust yourself to me and not let the events around you circumvent my purposes and plans for you. All right. Now, drop down to verse 36. Now, you got to watch this. He says, none of these guys are going to get into this land except Caleb. Verse 36. Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. He shall see it. And to him and will I give the land that he has trodden upon. And I'm going to give it to his children because why? Check this out. Because he has wholly followed the Lord. Now, we've got, I don't know how many at least three million men and only one? Huh? Three million men have an opportunity to get their inheritance. One is only going to get it at this point in time. Now it takes 24 hours for Joshua to get on board with Caleb. So there were for 24 hours, this man Caleb stands alone in a culture of unbelief. Talk about being disheartened in heart. He had 3 million and Joshua against him for 24 hours. And God singles this man out here in verse 36. Now, when he says that Caleb wholly followed the Lord... This is going to characterize him in a way that I want to share with you this morning. Holy following the Lord. That's the thing I want you to get for 2014. That you set your mind or your heart to wholly follow the Lord in 2014. Because that's the only way you're going to get in. Because that's the only way Caleb got in. Right or wrong? Right? Right. Now... Look at Numbers. Go to, chat, go to the book of Numbers. And let's read the account from Numbers. So what we, what, we, what we just got out of Deuteronomy is that Caleb wholly followed the Lord. That's why he got in. No one else did. But there's another aspect of how, what makes me this kind of person that characterizes me as wholly following the Lord to set me up to receive what I have or what's coming for me in 2014. 
And we're going to find out one more piece before I jump into this message. Numbers 13, let's look at verse 30. This account, then we, it says this account, Caleb stilled, stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We will not be able to go up against this people, for they are stronger than we are. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched out unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants and were in our own sight as what? Grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Verse, um, chapter 14, verse 8. If the Lord delights in us, this is Caleb still speaking, chapter 14, numbers, verse 8, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not, but all the congregation bade stone him with stones. I don't want to hear this. So they're going to kill the only guy that stands out with faith in a culture of unbelief. He's going to get, he's about ready to get stoned. So you know what? You stand in a culture of unbelief. You may even have it in your own household. Maybe in this church. I don't know. All I'm saying is this, this is no different. Caleb is no different than you and I facing our inheritance with giants and with the temptation of having a grasshopper complex that we can't do it. There's no way. Do you understand what's happening around about us? Now go to Numbers 14, verse 21. But as truly as I live, now this is God speaking now. Caleb had his turn. Here's God. As truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with my glory, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swore unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoked me see it, but my servant Caleb. Now watch. Because why? He has a different spirit that will cause him to wholly follow the Lord, which will result in him manifesting his inheritance on earth as it is in heaven. You see that? So what characterizes Caleb is that he has a different spirit and he's going to possess his inheritance. Now, what does it mean to have a different spirit in order to wholly follow the Lord. And what does it mean to wholly follow the Lord? There are two things I want you to get as you face and approach or embark 2014. What it means to wholly follow the Lord and what it means to have a different spirit. Now a different spirit is first of all he doesn't see himself as a grasshopper. They do. He doesn't. That's a result of having a different spirit. Everybody else sees their identity, skewed identity. He sees his identity. See the difference? It's, it's how he saw himself. But he can only see himself different from everybody else because he has a different spirit. If he has the same spirit as everybody else, he's going to line up in unbelief in that, with the culture of unbelief. So, it's our new identity in Christ is... is what we're, to, we're going after. That's, our, our, that's the different spirit today is knowing who we are in Christ. It's after the new creation being born of the spirit. Now what happens to Israel at Kadesh Barnea, and this is that event when they're getting ready to go into the land of Canaan, is full of principles and truths that apply to us today, especially this year and the season that we're in. Now Caleb, being a different spirit, operating from a different dimension in a world that he's not of. I'm going to say that again. Caleb is a man of a different spirit operating from a different dimension in a world he's not of. He walks to a different beat of a drum. 
He's not hearing the same voices that others are hearing. He's not murmuring in his tent. He's sitting there anticipating the next day to go in and take the, the land. Big difference. Now watch this. One family is murmuring in their tents about all the garbage happening around about them. Pressure, events, situations, circumstances. And here's another family just can't wait to see what God's going to do out of all this fortified cities and, and land and all that. Two different mentalities happening, but there's only one man. I'm not, I don't know. I'm going to keep saying this because I want you to get it. One man, eventually it'll be two, one man out of three million. You remember me telling you that the majority is always wrong? You cannot follow the majority. When has it ever been right, especially in the kingdom of God? John the Baptist was, was a minority. Jesus and 12 disciples. 12? you got to be kidding me. That's all you can muster up? <coughs> 12? Where is it? Oh, it, it, it evolved into 70. Okay, he sent 70 out. And then we know that after his death and resurrection, we got about 120 in an upper room. There were religions during that day, scores of people involved in different religions. And here we've got Jesus doing, I mean, I came. Three and a half years, I gave myself to the Lord, to the ministry. I died on a cross. I got resurrected and showed myself to many people for 40 days and 40 nights. And all I could muster up is 120 people in an upper room. I mean, I've given myself to the ministry. I've done all that I could do. And I could say the same thing about me right now in this church. And look at the, minor, the majority of churches that are way bigger, got a whole lot more going on, and have a complex, a grasshopper complex of we're nothing. We're insignificant. It's that church over there that's significant. It's that church over there got a big band coming in and got a big movie star coming in and got all this stuff going on. But what's it going to translate into? In that particular church, what, more divorce? Oh, we had a great time, but it didn't translate and manifest into anything. And that's what I'm talking about. I don't, I don't need that. I don't need a band. Don't give me a band this year. And don't give me a movie star. Don't give me, don't give me this stuff, man. I want truth. But you know what? It, this thing's going to keep playing out. And that's why he only had 120 in the upper room, because people don't want what's real and authentic. They want the fake. They want the form and the plastic. It offers more hype. It offers more um, goosebumps and more entertainment and, 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 and feeds the flesh. Do you want stuff to feed your flesh or do you want stuff to feed your spirit? Hmm? Let me ask you this question. Let's break it down first the natural, then the spiritual. Do you see chains and chains and chains of restaurants opening up all over the place that operate on a healthy food diet? Or do you keep seeing the McDonald's and the Burger Kings and the Wendy's and the Hardee's? What's popular? It's, I don't see, I don't even know the health food place that specializes solely in health food. And if you do, it ain't a chain. It's not easy access. Hmm? Yeah, they don't last that long. So it's the same way in the spiritual. It just give me the junk food because it just it's a, it's a quick it's a quick fix. It tastes good, but it doesn't go anywhere and do anything in my body. I just gain weight, gain get more calories, more fat grams. It's, it clogs up my arteries, and I die an early death. Right? Spiritually, people are dying on the vine while we keep bringing all this. Man, when you got money and you got people, you can do all kinds of things, but it doesn't translate into life. It doesn't translate into that. And so I'm, out, I'm, I'm looking for people that have a different spirit. I'm, I'm going after the, having a different spirit. And I only want to be around people that have a different spirit as well. I don't, the majority, I said all that to say, is not who I'm following. Sorry, I'm not. Okay. Right? Now watch this. Now, different um, means... Different spirit, you may want to write this down, means after spirit. It means behind. 
It means second thought. It means afterthought. The, the, the think again, rethink something, that's the way of faith. Now I say, what does that mean? What does that mean, what you just said? That doesn't make any difference. Spirit means after spirit, after thought, second thought. See, when you approach a situation or circumstance, I call it you, get, you, you have a knee-jerk reaction to everything that happens to you. Kids do something wrong. Wife does something wrong. Um, job goes haywire. Uh, you wake up and a situation occurs. And we always get this knee-jerk reaction. And you understand that that knee-jerk reaction is always a fleshly reaction because we are in the flesh. So when something happens to you, the first look is through the eyes of the flesh. Right? So when this, the children of Israel go into the promised land, their first look is through the eyes of the flesh, and they see giants, and they see themselves as grasshoppers. That's the knee-jerk reaction to all the fortified cities, the walls, the giants. They had a first look. Now, having a different spirit says, I see that, but I'm going to rethink this thing according to what God says. Not what my five senses are, are seeing and surmising, right? So in every situation you face, whether you go home and you thought you had so much money in the checkbook and then you really don't and you've got a bill, there's going to be a knee-jerk reaction that's going to result in murmuring in the tent, being discouraged in heart, or you're going to give it a second look according to what God says and result in praising in that tent because I trust Him and He's faithful to do what He says He's going to do rather than result in murmuring because I didn't have the second look. I stayed with the first look of the flesh rather than take the second look of the Spirit. That's what Caleb did. That's what it means to have a different spirit. So there are going to be things happening in your life in 2014 that's going to give you a knee-jerk reaction of the flesh. Now, you can stay in that realm of the flesh, murmur in your tent, be discouraged in heart, see, have a grasshopper complex, and miss out on God being able to deliver you, according to his word. You went ahead and stayed in the tent and refused to receive God's best. You went ahead and just dealt with what was handed to you, and you didn't manifest heaven on earth. You confirmed earth on earth, right? Huh? So that's what it means to have a different spirit. Um, and the result of, of having that different spirit is that you're wholly following the Lord. Now, what, is I, what, what do I mean by wholly following? Now, now you understand what different spirit means, right? It's taking a second look after the spirit, not looking with the first look of the flesh. That's the way of faith. Now, what's it mean to wholly follow the Lord? It means that you're going to pursue God with, and I, don't, I really don't like to say this because people use this, and I don't, they don't even, I don't believe they really understand what it means. But I'm going to say it because it's still true. It means that you are pursuing God with passion. All right? It, it's, it, when I say passion, it means it's a relationship that you have. You have emotions, feelings, faith, all the dynamics of that. Involved. It's a reality. It's not just a, a textbook God that you've got principles and formulas, but it's a reality that you are relating to a person that you're in love with, that you have um, faith and, and, and emotions and all, all the dynamics of the corporate person of who you are. It's involved. It's a passionate uh, pursuit. It's like a hunter who has prey. He's hunting prey, and he's not going to give up till he kills what he's hunting after. I mean, it means that... Bad weather. You know, we just got out of hunting season, and these guys are going to sit in trees in cold weather, in rain, or sleet, or snow, or whatever, until they get it, until they get their deer. That's dedication. That's passion. And and no matter what, they're going to they're going to they've come up with ways and means to, to get their 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 prey. And so, wholly following the Lord is you're doing it with passion. You're not going to quit because of the weather. You're not going to give up because it got hard. Or you're not going to stop because other people aren't doing what you're doing. You know, I'm not following the Lord on that level. 
Well, sorry, I am. You're not going to you're not going to quit because you don't see no one else following the Lord on that level or being that passionate. You're going to follow through. Now watch. Follow means you're going to fulfill this thing to the end, to completion. Now why I'm using this today for 2014 is you're going to be determined to be of a different spirit in 2014, and you're going to complete this thing. You're not going to end it in, in a catastrophe, or you're not going to end it dot, a dead, not literally, but you're not going to end it as a failure. You're not going to end it just, you know, I gave up somewhere around June. Screw this. I'm out of here. And for the next six months, you just check out. And I know people personally that had pressure come on them, and they checked out for months. And if not months, maybe some days, maybe a week or two. Why? Why let, why let the devil have a week of your, li of, your, of your life out of the year? I'm saying that you're going to be determined. I'm taking this thing all the way to the end. Not only, not only the end, you could say this the end of my life, but let's just ca compartmentalize this and say I'm going, to, I'm going to be of a different spirit this year. I'm going, to, I'm going to pursue God all the way to the end of 2014, and I'm going to get everything that God has for me. You remember the message we did, leaving nothing on the table? That's the same thing. I think that was a New Year message. Maybe not next year, last year, but the year before. But there was where we talked about covenant and all that God's given us and feasting at the table and not getting up, leaving anything. It's all there. Get it. Why, don't, why get up hungry? That doesn't make any sense. Man, we don't do that when we go sit down. We don't get up hungry. You, I, I'm, if you invite me to your house, I'm not getting up hungry unless you don't feed me enough. And we know God's unlimited. Like with David, if that wasn't enough, I would have given you so much more. Right? You know the most frustrating thing, and I know, don't hear what I'm not saying, I'm, I'm kind of being funny, is hey, being invited over to somebody, somebody's house and, and there's not enough food to eat. And, you know, rather than get like um, four or five pieces of pizza, you maybe only, you only get two. And it's like, yeah, I'm still hungry. And then you got to go home and eat. Huh? You ever, you ever, has that ever happened to you? Yes. Or, and I'm restaurant. You, you, you're paying a lot of money for this food in its, in its tiny little portions? you got to be kidding me. This, this, this is, and I'm going to go away hungry for this much money that I've spent? No. And that's why some people like rides. <laughs> the buffet. I'm getting all, I mean, you leave there with your second stomach full. Right? I'm saying that I'm going to complete this course. I'm going to fulfill it to the full. It's like a runner running a race. He's not going to quit in the 10th mile if he's running a marathon. He's not going to quit at the 20th. He's going to finish the course. And that's what Paul said in his own life. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. Well, let's compartmentalize that. Let's just make it about 2014. Well, I can't be concerned about 2015. I'm not in 2015. I really can't be concerned about the end of my life. God only knows when that's going to be. That could be another 40 years from now. So why am I going to be concerned about finishing my course then? Let's, let's just, the season that we're in, we get through this one, which, like I said last week, by faith, we've already made 2014. God's gone before us, like he did Israel. He said, I've gone before you. Go possess the land. God's already been at your 2014. That's why it's all yours. He's already been there. Every battle's already been won in him. I mean, you may have a hell of a time in June, but you've got to understand today he's already been at June, and I've already won June. So when June happens, I'm walking in the thing. Yeah, it's making me sweat a little bit, and it's got me off course, but I'm going to finish through. I'm going to run through June because he's already won it for me. Why peter out in June? I'm going all the way to the end of 2014 and get what's mine. That's holy following the Lord. Now, you can understand this because Israel, three million guys, didn't have a different spirit and came up again, and Kadesh Barnea came up to the promised land and petered out. Went back into the wilderness and died out. That, that's not holy following the Lord. Can't holy follow the Lord unless you have a different spirit. Because there's going to be times that, that, this year that your knee jerk reaction is, I can't do this. I can't, I, there's no way I can get, I, I can't make this happen. Huh? I mean, maybe you don't get discouraged. Maybe life is really good to you. You have no problems. 
But it's easy to, to get discouraged. And day after day after day in a culture of unbelief and you surround yourself with the murmurs and the complainers and the bitchers and all the stuff and the bitching and all the stuff that goes on. Come on. How do you... How do you... You have to have a different spirit to be able to endure constant murmuring and complaining, especially if it's in your own household or in your church or your job or your relatives. It's tough. And, you, and the only way is, and I'm going to tell you what though, it's possible, very possible, because you've got, and this is why I like this. Well, you know what? My whole household's against me. They're not believing in God, so I give up. No, 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 no. Here's a man who had three million people against him. God, you, you, have you ever just, that's why I'm really wanting to stop and let you let that sink in. Does anybody know how many people are in the state of West Virginia? One million. That's three times. Can you imagine everybody in the state of West Virginia picketing you outside your home? Calling you every evil, every man. I mean, they're, they're ready to stone him. This is life and death for Caleb. Three times the size of the state of West Virginia, the population of West Virginia against him. That's, that's a man of a different spirit. And I don't know if we have that. But I'm going to ask for it. Well, as a matter of fact, I have it. But am I going to be able to release it in a culture of unbelief? Yes. Yes. That's, that's, that's really where we're at. Now, how do we bring to full term our faith? It's not going to be by the sweat of the brow. It's a Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. Entering into rest. Striving. Laboring. To enter into rest when everything else around you says the opposite. And this is not about willpower. This is not about performance. This is about simply amending God's promises in spite of everything happening. Amening. Amen means so be it. That's what Mary said. I mean, one of the most, really, I'm going to get pregnant by a spirit. You know, God's going to overshadow me. She said... Be it done unto me according to your word. That's amen. That's the posture of Caleb. God said it. I, I amen it. So be it. Let's go take the land. In spite of all the culture around of unbelief. Or the family of unbelief. Or the friends of unbelief. Or your pastor of unbelief. You know? That's you bring to full term your faith that way by simply amening God in His Word. Now Abraham did this; he believed God. God credited him as righteousness. Put the man asleep and said, "I'm going to do it all. You just believe and trust me." Mary did it. Now watch the five senses can't make heads or tails out of this kind of message. It's going to want to do its first look. But Abraham, Mary, or whoever are the other even millions of, of throughout the Bible. In the history of the church was able to do the exploits because they were of a different spirit but it's a minority I want you to catch that it's a minority it's not the majority that that, that has a different spirit most people go after the flesh they go after the five senses and they they work according to that rather than having a different spirit a different spirit is having something happen to you okay and this is where Christians end up. They say, God, do you see what's happening? And then they see a promise of what God says he's going to do. And then they say, but look at this thing happening to me. And, then they, and it's, this, it's, it's back and forth. They're crying out to God for help and then murmuring in their tents. And they never, ever come to the place of rest. That's not... That, see, they're... they're, 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 they're that's like Peter. What, what was it when um, he, he uh, started to sink? And, and Jesus said, why did you double think is the Greek? Not you of little faith, but why did you double think? The fact that you double thought this thing, you saw the waves and you saw me say come. And rather than saying focus on me saying come, you took the focus off of me onto the waves and that made you double think. 
See, and he began to sink. In every situation we go through, we're going to sink. And how we sink is when we get into double thinking. And double thinking is not being in that different spirit, but having that knee-jerk reaction to, to, in the flesh, and then trying to get over here to God, but then come back over to the flesh, then this is what we do all the time. This is double thinking. Some people don't even get over to, to double thinking. They stay in the carnality of the first look of the flesh. They never entertain that God has a promise about this. And they just deal with it according to the flesh and their five senses. They trouble, troubleshoot it, try to fix it, and create an Ishmael, get through it, and wood, hay, and stubble because God wasn't even involved in it. You saved yourself. You didn't trust God. Um, then there's those who will stop and do the, the look at God and try to get into the second, the second look, the second thought of the Spirit. But then they come back over here. And then they come back over here. And then they come back over here, and they're at a standstill. Still doesn't work. That's double thinking. And you still think, well, at least, God, I gave you the thought. I did consider you. No, you kept going over here. Peter, Jesus, waves. Peter, Jesus, waves. Waves, Jesus. This is what he did. And he began to sink. If he just would have stayed focused on what got him out of the boat, he'd stayed on top of the water. And I'm telling you, I know you want to be the head all through 2014 and not be under your situation and circumstances. So we've got to get to this place in 2014 that you know we're going to be a people of a different spirit that wholly follow the Lord. And the key in helping you do that is surround yourself with people who will encourage you. If you get into discouragement, I trust you, you sink. Because it says it right there. We, I showed you where they said, and the people discouraged us. Now, we've got innocent people on this side of, of, of Canaan waiting for those 12 spies to come back. It's not their job. It was the 12 spies to come back with a good report. That bad report of the 10 discouraged millions of people. Look how just one bad apple can really wreak havoc to the rest of the apples. <laughs> Maybe somebody should have told Michael Jackson that. One bad apple don't spoil that whole... What, how's it go? <laughs> you know, but it can. Ten guys screwed up a whole generation of people. Ten! So be aware of what one negative thought, one negative person but I'm telling you, don't fear, because if you're of a different spirit, you'll recognize. There you go. But man, I don't ever want to be that alone. One against three million. Two against three million. Moses doesn't count. He's, he can't go in. He's done. He's going to go up on the mountain and die here real soon. So Moses doesn't count. Two against three million. Haven't we, always, haven't we always said this? If God be for me, who could be against me? In a culture of unbelief, folks, you are going to hit, in 2014, masses of unbelief. Come on. You've got to know that the majority you surround yourselves around, or the stuff you hear on TV, or the places you go, is a culture of unbelief. But you and I are going to be of a different spirit. And we're going to Amen. see 2014 all the way through. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Yes. Father, we thank you for your word. Yes, Lord. And I pray, God, that faith arose thank you, Jesus. this morning. Thank you. That we, as we embark on 2014... That you will give us the grace and the faith that we operate is not even our own faith. That's the gift that you've given us as well. So it's your grace, it's your faith. And we're in you. Our life is hidden in you. No weapon formed against us in 2014 is going to prosper. And that's going to be according to our faith. Now it can prosper if we're in unbelief. But if we keep entrusting ourselves to God, he's going to be faithful to do what he says he's going to do. Father, I thank you that we are of a different spirit. 
we are of a different spirit. And we are not going to be prey or victimized by a culture of unbelief. And if it comes down to like David and Ziklag, when everyone's against you, we and God alone, if God be for me, who can be against me, we'll do what David did if necessary. We will encourage ourselves in the Lord. If we can't get it anywhere else, we can get it from the Lord. But we will get encouraged. And we won't stay in discouragement. Because staying in discouragement is going to hinder us appropriating all that you have for us in 2014. Because discouragement is a killer. It's a killer. And I don't think we realize how much an enemy discouragement is. You want to give up. You want to quit. You're in despair. The Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick. Discouragement kept a whole generation out of the promised land. And Hebrews says, while it's still called today, encourage one another. And I really believe in these last days, that is a missing element in the church today is encouragement. Because we're murmuring in the tents. I can't encourage you. I'm discouraged. I need you. I can't discourage you. Encourage you. I'm discouraged. And we're all discouraged. We're all sitting in Katie's Barnea's as grasshoppers. Going around the mountain another time. So, Father God, we're done. We're looking for that which is real and authentic. And we're going to go after that with a different spirit, holy following the Lord in 2014. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.